Yeah, so I'm going to talk all about um, successes in natural language processing, and I want to talk about a few architectures, a few neural architectures that have been used. Um, and I want to uh, highlight several questions, I think, which arise from these architectures, which are very, very interesting. Um, just briefly, problems in speech and language. Here are uh, a few examples. One is speech recognition. This is the problem of learning to transform an acoustic sequence. So we've shown a spectrogram here uh, to a sentence. Uh, second task is machine translation. This is the problem of translating from one language to another language. Uh, final example, which I'll talk about hopefully fairly extensively at the end of this talk, is question answering. Um, where the problem is we have a question and we have a Wikipedia page or maybe the entire web, we want to return an answer. Okay, so these are examples of problems arising in speech and natural language. Um, these are sort of old, old problems in some sense. They go to the core of uh, problems in artificial intelligence. Okay, ever, ever since computers were invented, um, these, these methods have been around. Uh, I think in the, in the 40s, people were talking about translation using statistical methods, for example. So um, I'm going to show my age a little bit, but I'm trying to give a bit of a personal perspective here. And I, I feel like I witnessed uh, uh, at least two revolutions, uh, but I would definitely highlight these as being the two revolutions. So I started my PhD in 1994, and that was probably just a few years, maybe just four or five years, into a first statistical revolution in natural language processing. And so let me uh, explain what I mean by this. Um, so, you know, if you go back to all of these problems, our goal is to design some function that maps some input to some output, much in the same way that linear regression does in, in standard statistical models. Um, although these mappings are complex, right? Like machine translation mapping between one language and another language is very complex, as is speech recognition, as is, I would argue, uh, question answering. So we're trying to build a function that maps uh, inputs x to labels y. And uh, certainly for the decade or two before I started my graduate work in the 70s and 80s, in natural language processing at least, um, people really focused on rule-based systems, sort of logic-based systems, systems inspired by ideas from linguistics, which I still think has a tremendous amount of, to offer, you know, formal linguistics, Chomsky and so on. And they tried to construct these systems by hand. They quickly found that this was uh, sort of a very challenging task. They became overwhelmed by the complexity of these problems. And this is what led people to a statistical approach. So in supervised learning approaches, we essentially gather, uh, example, pairs, x, y pairs, where x is an input and y is an output. So for example, in translation, you would gather many example translations. And you try to basically learn that function from these examples. Okay? And how you uh, define the parameters of that function, how you learn that function, and so on, is basically, that is, machine, that is supervised machine learning. So there's a long history of this in, in speech and language processing. Um, it really goes back to the 70s for speech recognition. Um, and then I would say since at least the late 80s in natural language processing. And actually part of the move into natural language processing came from researchers, for example, at IBM who'd worked in speech and then were then moving into language. Um, and um, yeah, so this is supervised learning. And I'll quote Jan here. I think this is a beautiful quote. The revolution will not be supervised. Um, there is the question of how we can make use of unlabeled data, and that may be the third revolution. I think uh, one of Jan's points, maybe. Um, but I'll get to that at the end of the talk. So that was the first revolution. Second revolution was the neural one, uh, in my view. And this has been transformative in the field. Um, and I have a couple of graphs here, one from speech recognition, one from uh, ImageNet uh, classification of images. So the first one is speech recognition on a famous data set called Switchboard, which uh, consists of telephone conversations between people. It's introduced in the mid-90s. Um, initial result was about 43% word error rate. Quickly came down to 19, say, or 15. And you'll notice there's a long plateau there from around 04 to 12. I think um, that's kind of indicative. And then suddenly there's this fall off, and that was the advent of neural methods. And actually, in the first part of my talk, I'll talk about um, a little bit about how this was achieved. And the, the, the transformation in speech recognition has been absolutely dramatic. Speech recognizers work much, much better. They work pretty well a few years ago, but they work really well now, I think. Um, the second problem is ImageNet, which many of you have seen. And, and there's even more dramatic progress here, essentially through, I think, A, data. We suddenly had this beautiful data set, ImageNet, which had millions of features, but B, convolutional networks, which was shown to produce amazing results on this task. <clears throat> 
So let me give you a, a slightly personal view on this, and I'm going to look at a particular problem in language processing. Um, you could look at any number of problems. Machine translation would be another. Um, but this is a problem I'll talk about in the second part of my talk. And this is the problem of natural language parsing. And actually, this is something that I did my PhD thesis on, so something I've followed right the way through from the mid-90s. Um, the problem here is to take a sentence as input and to produce um, a representation of the grammatical structure of that sentence, very much in a, a similar way to the sentence diagrams that many would, of you would have drawn in school. So identifying the main verb of the sentence, identifying the subject, identifying the object, and so on. Um, the motivation for this is that it at least to some extent can be thought of as a first step in identifying sentence meaning, although when we see the neural methods throughout this talk, you'll see there are interesting questions about the role, if any, that these structures will play. But still, it's a very interesting problem, learning to map sentences to these, these syntactic structures. And again, you know, um, starting in the 60s, people had taken linguistic theories due to Chomsky and others and tried to implement them. And they'd found this an incredibly difficult task, um, basically for two reasons. Firstly, coming up with a set of rules that covers ev everything you see in language is extremely challenging. And secondly, natural languages, unlike, say, programming languages, have extreme ambiguity. And this was a real surprise. So if you try to set, write down a set of rules and apply it to a sentence, you'll end, often end up with thousands or tens of thousands of interpretations, most of them extremely implausible, but all of them in some sense grammatically correct. Okay, so you can think about the problem being how do we sift through these things. And so here is sort of like a, uh, a rough sketch of progress on the natural language parsing problem. And this is by no meant to be exhausted, an exhaustive list of all the results, but this will sort of give you an idea of the trajectory. Um, this is parsing accuracy on um, a data set uh, of these syntactic structures, so tens of thousands of training examples like this uh, that you can train a model on, you can evaluate a model on, drawn from the Wall Street Journal, so pretty complex sentences, easily 25, 30, 40 words in length, plenty of room for ambiguity. Um, and let me tell you a little about, bit about these results. So Magaman's result was just coming out as I started. Uh, this was the first result on the tree bank, and at the time it was eye-opening. It was uh, due to Magaman and other researchers at IBM using decision tree methods. And then Eugene Charniak and myself um, looked at variants of probabilistic context-free grammars, which are sort of probabilistic branching processes, essentially, applied to language with some nuances that led to much better performance on parsing than sort of vanilla probabilistic context-free grammars. And then we moved into a phase where we um, Jan mentioned the conditional random fields and also the perceptron, where we basically came up with methods where you could introduce rich handcrafted features. Believe it or not, we, we weren't quite sure how to do that in the early days, and that pushed us up to around 92% or so. And then things were really quite stuck for quite a long time. Um, and in the last few years, uh, performance, the latest result is close to 96% on this, on this data set, which is a level of performance I never thought I would have seen. So these parsers are now resolving all kinds of ambiguities, uh, and, and that, that, that's just remarkable. Okay. Um, there's also another interesting data point here, I think, which is James Henderson's work in 2003. And so that's actually a neural, neural method, and that was an early neural method, and it's a really impressive result, and it was an impressive result at the time. But you'll see that, I guess, maybe it's computational power, or maybe it was just know-how in terms of how to build these models. This is one of the things which happened, is that at the time, um, it was hard to foresee the future. It's difficult when you look at results like this. When we talk about empiricism, and I really do believe that empirical data is really important in terms of driving progress, but at the same time, people are always trying to predict the future in terms of what's gonna pay off. And it wasn't clear if you just looked at that first part of the graph that neural methods were gonna do what they were gonna do. Um, or at least not to me. Okay, so um, let me go uh, give an overview of the rest of the talk. Um, it's gonna be in three parts, and I'm gonna talk about three problems and three architectures for those problems, sort of building up in complexity. Um, the first is um, some work we did on speech recognition and some um, simple feed-forward networks. Uh, the second part will be on natural language parsing, and I'll talk about the combination of uh, what are called word embeddings and feed-forward networks. 
which have uh, led to a first extraordinary increase in parsing accuracy. And in the third part, I'll talk about uh, question answering, which uh, is a, a task that I'm really excited about. Uh, I'll talk about a data set that we've just released from uh, Google, and I'll talk about transformers, which are, in some sense, the latest, most powerful model for, for, for NLP overall, and we'll build naturally on the ideas of word embeddings. Okay. So, uh, part one. This is joint work with Afna May, who was a PhD student of mine, uh, Faye Shah, and many of his collaborators at, uh, at UCLA, uh, Brian Kingsbury and Michael Piccani at IBM. Okay. Um, so, in this part of the talk, I'm going to consider some empirical results on fully connected networks. Um, so, these are neural networks in speech. They might have on the order of 1,000 or 2,000 nodes per hidden layer. They're densely connected. Um, they might typically have three or four layers. Um, at least in the early days of this work, um, performance didn't really improve beyond that number of layers. Um, it's an old architecture for speech recognition. I'll describe in a moment how it's used for uh, speech recognition, but it's an effective one. And actually, this was really the architecture which made the initial splash on speech recognition. Um, and I would argue it's still not well understood, but there are many, many interesting questions in terms of how we just analyze these simple networks. And what I'm going to describe is a set of empirical results comparing to, uh, actually, we, we implemented large-scale Rahimi and Rect features um, which Rahimi and Rech, of course, sort of started, was, was the impetus for this workshop. So here's a sketch of the, the overall architecture uh, using a feed forward net or using the Rahimi and Rech features. So we have some, some um, acoustic waveform. We splice it into 10 millisecond frames, perhaps, and we do some analysis of each 10 milliseconds, maybe get a, a vector, say 40 dimensions representing the uh, energy at different frequencies. And then um, the job of the neural net, or other classifier, is to take in a 10 millisecond portion of uh, speech and predict a distribution over underlying phonemes. So basically over sounds in the language, A, B, T, H, Z, H, and so on, okay? So we're trying to predict this uh, conditional distribution. You have a 10 millisecond frame of speech. You might look at the uh, 40 dimensional vector at the 10 millisecond portion, also in the surrounding context. So you might have a vector of dimension 400, maybe the concatenation of these 10 frames, okay? Um, the resulting data can be large. So um, one set of experiments is 50 hours of broadcast news, has about 16 million training points, and actually 5,000 different phoneme labels. Uh, there's a lot of labels, That's a, there's a kind of technical reason for that. Um, so, and this is, a relatively small data set by speech standards, you can easily get uh, data sets with hundreds of millions of points or billions. Okay. Um, so one architecture is going to be um, the feed forward net I just showed you. The other architecture I'm gonna talk about is a kernel method. So this is the method kind of underlying uh, support vector machines. And so uh, a kernel is simply uh, or roughly speaking, a measure of similarity between two points, x and y. So think of x and y as being two of these speech vectors. Um, and uh, you know, one common choice is what's called a Gaussian kernel. So kxy, we take the Euclidean distance between x and y, we square it, uh, we exponentiate, uh, we divide by sigma squared, which is just a, a, a scale. Um, and you know, Vapnik's observation, which actually goes back to work on the perceptron from the 60s. Um, so this was used in conjunction with the perceptron way back when. The observation is that if you can compute, basically, this function corresponds to an inner product in some space, which basically involves an infinite series in this case, a kind of Taylor, just simple Taylor series or some kind of expansion will show that. Um, and you can essentially learn in this implicit high dimensional space uh, by going to a dual and using various optimization tricks. As a result, you end up with what Jan rightfully referred to as a shallow or template-based method. Um, you can apply it to MNIST, but it's kind of, I mean, it, it's kind of crazy to think that I could take a, a photograph of this scene and take another photograph and, and rely on Euclidean distance between the vectors of pixel values and hope to, hope to get something meaningful, right? So convolutional networks <coughs> are much, much more compelling architecture, and they perform much, much better. Um, but the question I want to dwell on here is a narrow question, but I think it's an interesting one, which is how well do these kernel methods actually fare compared to fully connected feed-forward networks? Because certainly, 
uh, a major issue with kernel-based methods is efficiency. But if you can get them to train um, on smaller uh, data sizes, we've typically seen quite comparable performance to feed-forward nets. This is where Rahimi and Recht comes in. So they have a randomized construction. And let me just actually skip over this. But um, they basically talk about a, a single layer neural architecture um, where you have a set of neurons with a cosine transfer function, which is slightly unusual, but it's justified by a kind of a Fourier analysis of the original kernel we're showing here. Um, and the weights at the bottom layer are simply random weights. Okay? So um, if you sample these random weights from a Gaussian, you actually end up with a representation that approximates um, the Gaussian kernel I just showed you. And as you vary the sampling distribution, you get uh, different kernels. Okay? So you can actually end up with a randomized construction that approximates a given kernel. Um, and the nice thing about this is you can control the number of features, but you can start to sort of simulate a kernel um, with, with re reasonable precision by generating a large number of random features. So here are some results. Um, and this is you know, skipping over a lot of details. Um, but the end story is that you know, we use a feature selection method on the randomized features I just showed you. Uh, we use a bottleneck top layer, which means we have a low rank decomposition of the very top layer of weights. But the most important thing here is that really, you know, across four data sets, we have Bengali, Cantonese, we have Timit, and we have Broadcast News, you can essentially approach the performance of a feedforward neural network. So the results are close to indistinguishable. If you look at broadcast news, 16.4 versus 16.4 on dev, 11.7 versus 11.6 on test data. These are uh, sort of word error rates. Okay? So at least for this data set size, this is, this is re reasonable evidence, I think, that um, you know, these randomized features can do almost as well as a, as a feed-forward net. You know, why is this important? Well, I think it might shed some light on the behavior of fully connected uh, neural networks. And I guess this is a kind of surrogate in some sense, in that the randomized model is a simple model which seems to be tracking the performance of a deep neural net. So you know, there's one question is, do fully connected networks, in terms of generalization, um, do they actually go beyond sort of template methods, or are they actually doing something uh, rather similar in terms of their, their, their inductive biases and how they generalize? Um, one thing, though, is that fully connected networks do appear to be more compact. They have stacks of like three or four layers, 2,000 units per layer. We had to go up to order 100K or 400K of these random features to start to approach the performance of a neural net. And I think there are very interesting questions of why that's the case. Um, <laughs> If fully connected networks are not doing useful representation learning, then presumably convolutional networks or LSTMs or the transformers I'll show you later are certainly learning improved representation. So maybe it's the, the topological structure of these networks that, or parameter sharing or other things that is driving much of the generalization. Are there random feature methods that match uh, structured rec uh, networks such as convolutional nets? Um, that may be tough because people have been thinking about that for many years and so on. And finally, you know, can, can these results from random features at least help our understanding of the generalization properties of fully connected networks? Okay, so that's part, part one. Um, the second problem I'm going to talk about is dependency parsing, so a particular type of syntactic analysis. And here I want to sort of go up a level of complexity and introduce word embeddings. Uh, and this is uh, partly based on work at Google with uh, Daniel Landor, Chris Alberti, and others. OK, so um, first key innovation, which really made neural networks work on natural language problems. And this is interesting because it's, it's something you don't see in speech or vision or the other problems you'd seen uh, where neural networks really works. Um, this is the following idea. So basically, I, for each word in the vocabulary, I'm going to have an associated uh, vector of relatively low dimension, say order of 100 to 1,000. You know, a typical value might be 300 dimensions. Um, so you can think of a, a dictionary lookup where each word gets mapped to a 300 dimensional vector. Um, those parameters, those vectors are learned. Okay? So they're just treated as yet more parameters in the model. You can back propagate into them. You can alter them using gradient 
descent and so on, okay? And intuitively, these vectors are going to uh, capture important properties of words. So most naively, you might think that, quote, similar words, I really don't like this terminology, but similar words end up in similar parts of the space. Or another way to think about it, I, uh, which I pr would prefer, is that you know, this vector allows you to ask all kinds of questions about the word just using simple dot products. So you, can, you hope that it captures meaningful structure in the lexicon and meaningful structure in the words. And in a nutshell, when I showed you these, these parsing results going back to here, we had very limited ways of using these kind of embeddings, these kind of sharings, and we basically treated every word as distinct. Okay, that's a crude way of thinking about it. Um, okay, so here's the embedding. And here's an architecture from Colbert et al, uh, from JMLR in about 2011, which in retrospect is sort of a visionary idea. Um, and so the, 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 the basic idea is, it's a simple idea is the following. In many problems in language, you have an input, which is a window of words, say k equals four words, and you're trying to make some prediction. Maybe you're trying to predict what the part of speech is for saw, for example, whether it's a verb or a noun or whatever, okay? Um, and to, to, to um, attack this kind of problem using embeddings, you do the following. So in a first step for each word in the vocabulary, you look up the associated embedding vector. In a second step, step, you simply stack those vectors or concatenate them. So we've gone from four four-dimensional vectors to one 16-dimensional vector now. And then we use that concatenation of vectors as input to a feedforward net. So you can think of these models as essentially simply combining this idea of low-dimensional embeddings of words with feedforward nonlinearities. Okay? Compare this to how we used to do things. How we used to do things is we would hand construct to construct features that were conjunctions of the input. So we'd say the first word is there, or the third word is sore, or we would have features saying the first word is there and the third word is sore, okay? Of course, usually we have many more words than just four coming in, so it gets more complex, but that's the basic idea. We would construct higher order features instead of learning embeddings and learning feedforward predictions. Um, so how do we apply this to parsing? So as I said, you know, this problem is uh, the problem of predicting a syntactic structure. Um, just go a little bit more into a little bit more detail here. What we have is a set of directed arcs between words showing grammatical relations. So for example, we have an arc from makes to bell with the n sub uh, label on it, or an arc from makes to products with uh, direct object uh, label. So we have these grammatical relations like subject, object, and so on. And one way to think about parsing is through what's called a shift reduce system. So the basic idea is we're going to represent a parse tree as a sequence of actions used to build the tree. And we're going to use a classifier to learn which action to take in which context. Okay, so let me show you a couple of these actions. At every point, we have some state of the parse, and it consists of a stack, a buffer, and a set of dependencies. So think of the stack as a working space. Think of the buffer as just the remaining words in the sentence. And think of the dependencies as just keeping track of which uh, dependency, la dependency labels you've created so far. So uh, one thing you can do is simply shift the top word from the buffer over to the stack. So basically, you're making a commitment to start working on that word. Another thing you can do is look at the top two elements on the stack and create an arc between them uh, from the the, the last word to the previous word, so this is a left arc with a particular label, for example, n such. Or we can create a right arc, we can look at the top two words. So basically just think about a, a sort of state machine where at each point you can shift something from the buffer to the stack, or you can connect an arc one way, or you can connect an arc the other way. And as you connect these arcs, you build up the structure of the tree, okay? And the, and the learning problem is if I give you the state of the stack, buffer, and the set of dependencies, make a prediction as to which uh, of these decisions to make yeah, uh, next, shift, left arc, or right arc, okay? And the difficulty, of course, again, lies in the grammar and the ambiguity in that, you know, they're, they're, there's a combinatorial number of possibilities if you go through the whole sentence, so it gets complica complicated. And um, here's the first architecture for this, uh, which really goes back to uh, Chen and Manning uh, from 2014, who I guess 
personally, you know, that this is the first time I saw a result in parsing, which was incredibly compelling, I think. And it's a simple idea. It builds entirely on the architecture I just spoke about. So basically, when you look at a parse state, you have a set of feature extractors which pull out different words from that state. Uh, so you might have something that pulls out the top word from the stack or the second word or the third or fourth, or the top word on the buffer or the second or third or fourth uh, word on the buffer. Um, typically, you might actually extract roughly 10 to 20 words like that. Uh, and that's your representation of the current state of things. You can try to make a prediction, shift or left arc or right arc, depending on that state. So we just look up an embedding um, for each word. Uh, we concatenate. We put it through a feedforward network, and we use that network to make the prediction of what to do next in the parse tree. Okay. And, and uh, here's another set of empirical results. Um, the value of this, I think, is that this is a, a, a challenging problem. It's a relatively large amount of data. Um, and you can make very direct comparisons to pre-neural methods. So the, the global linear model, the first model, is basically, it's actually a perceptron, uh, but with hand-constructed features and uh, some fancy training methods, global uh, training. Um, the last result, this is from the Ander et al. paper, um, uses a neural network, so it, it gives almost a 2% uh, increase, which is appreciable. The best result on this data set now is in, in the high 95s, probably close to 96. Um, a simple greedy approach that uses a neural net and simply takes the most likely action at every point actually outperforms the perceptron-based model, which is a lot more complicated. Okay? And, and that was one of the major results from Chen and Manning, that a neural network with a simple greedy approach, no beam search, no complicated search or training, uh, could basically just exceed, exceed, the, exceed the, the state of the art. Okay. So um, again, I, I want to finish this section with some, some questions. Uh, so the empirical results are, are compelling. I think this is, again, a goldmine of interesting questions. You know, why do word embeddings and feed-forward networks works often give dramatic gains? This is not just in parsing. This is in pretty much any classification problem you can think of where you use words as inputs. What class of functions can these words represent? Um, what class of functions can or do these networks learn? And what do the individual word embeddings encode? So the obvious way to think about this is just to look at similarity between pairs of words. But I'm rather skeptical about that. I think that's a very impoverished way of looking at what these representations are capturing. It doesn't really make sense to me to say, are these two objects similar? Well, they're both pieces of furniture, but one's made of wood, one's made of concrete. They're similar with respect to some attribute. You can ask questions about objects or words, for that matter, about does it have this attribute? Does it have this attribute? And that's what I suspect these embeddings are capturing. They're basically packing a lot of information into a space that allows you to ask questions about these words. Okay. Um, so the final task I want to talk about is uh, question answering. And the final architecture is going to be uh, transformers, which build on top of word, word embeddings. And this is going to be based on a couple of papers. The first uh, paper about a new data set we have from Google. And secondly, uh, a baseline method using something called BERT. OK. So the data set. So um, you know, after over the last year or two, we've been gathering training test examples of question answering pairs for basically end-to-end -end training of neural or other machine learning uh, uh, systems. Um, one important characteristic of this data set is that the questions are real. They're asked by real users. So these are query, aggregated queries issued to Google. And they're relatively complex. They're eight words or more. And um, the annotators are basically going to get a question. They're going to get a Wikipedia page, the, I think the, 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 the top ranked Wikipedia result for that question. And they're actually going to go through and mark where they find the, question, the answer on the page. Or they mark no answer if they can't find an answer. And they're also going to mark a short answer uh, where possible. We have over 300,000 training examples and about 16,000 dev and test examples with multi-way annotations. Um, and so there's been a lot of work on question answering, and there have been great data sets in the past. But you know, one of the selling points of this data set is that the queries are real. 
I'll give you a famous data set called Squad, which has had enormous impact, basically has people reading paragraphs from Wikipedia and composing questions. It's been great at driving research, but we think that tends to lead to questions which are too close to the initial paragraph, and we're always striving for natural annotation, something which is close to a, a task that we believe is, uh, is real. Here are some sample questions. I think it's just first 20 from a random set. There, I'm going to show plenty of examples here because I think they'll il illustrate many interesting questions with respect to neural methods. You know, when are hops added to the brewing process? What does the word China mean in Chinese? What is the meaning of Seder in Latin? Who lives in the Imperial Palace in Tokyo? And so on. Okay. Um, and here's what the annotations look like in a little bit more detail. We have this question, when was the Eggmo muffin added to the menu? Um, here's a Wikipedia page. Uh, the annotator has highlighted a paragraph, in this case a very short paragraph that contains the answer. And they've also highlighted a short answer, in this case 1972. So why are we interested in this? Um, firstly, it's useful. I think uh, people have questions they want answered all the time. So from an engineering point of view, you're solving a useful problem. Um, but just as importantly, if not more importantly, I think this is a great way to probe models for natural language understanding, for semantics, meaning whether models can encode common sense knowledge, whether they can do inference, and so on. So you know, we've, I spoke about syntax, which is something I'd worked on for many years. And I see question answering as being a way to get at many problems of meaning and understanding. OK. So let's look about, talk about transformers, which will basically you know, have led to the state of the art on this question answering task and many other question answering tasks. Um, and it's really a, a, a beautiful idea. And it builds very directly on the embeddings I showed you before. So let's assume we have a sequence of words, w1 through wn. Um, we can, again, take each word in the sequence and embed it. Um, so we can look up for each word it's embedding, x1 through xn. For the sake of argument, let's say these, these, these embedding vectors have 512 dimensions. This was the value used in the, the paper by Vaswani et al. The question is going to be, how do we take this sequence of embeddings and map it to a new sequence of the same length and either a different dimensionality or the same dimensionality, um, where we somehow have an improved representation that takes into account context. So instead of you know, this simple lookup is going to generate a context-independent embedding, and now I'm going to take into account the context to build a, a more refined embedding, because of course you know, the context matters. right? Um, and there are many ways of doing this. You can use convolutional networks. Uh, you can use recurrent networks, but I'll, I'll describe uh, transformers. Um, and so the beauty of these is that they can be expressed very simply you know, using some matrix algebra. And I'll try to take you through the intuition for this. But um, assume we have a sequence of vectors x1 through xn, where each xi is d-dimensional, say d was 512. And I'll define capital Q to be a matrix that basically just summarizes the full sequence of embeddings for the sentence. So it has dimension n by d. So n is the length of sentence, d is the, the embedding size. The parameters of this transformation uh, are going to be three matrices, a, b, and c. And a and b are essentially going to take the original embeddings and project them down to a lower dimensional space of space L. And you can think of in a product in that new space as being a measure of how well each word pays att attention to each other word. OK? Um, and then C is going to be of dimension D by O. You can think of C as being a, 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 a linear projection from the original space down to low dimensional space. And the basic transformation, we'll see if we iterate a little bit on this, is basically to take QA B transpose QT that is simply an n by n matrix saying how much attention each word pays to, it, plays to other word. Softmax just normalizes each row, so that's a probability distribution that sums to one, actually exponentiates it and normalizes it. And then QC is, well, we'll come to that. Why don't I show a diagram? This might make things more clear. So the process can be visualized as follows. Um, for each word, say we're trying to compute a new representation for word three, so for each word, we look up the embedding. Uh, under a, a simple lookup. Um, 
we multiply each of these embeddings by some matrix C, which takes it down to a lower dimensional space, say four dimensions. And then I calculate this distribution. So I'm, I'm concentrating on the representation for SOAR, word three. And this is QA, B transpose Q. Uh, I take the softmax, so I get a distribution. I take the third row corresponding to SOAR. And then I just take a weighted sum of those four vectors. So I'm basically taking a weighted sum of all the vectors surrounding me. And that's my new representation for SOAR. And I do a si similar thing for every one of those words. And so I end up with a new representation for every word. And there are a few more bells and whistles. I actually do this, say, eight times if I use multi-head attention. Um, and so here I have parameters A, B, C for J equals 1 to 8. For each of these, I compute a new representation. I concatenate it. And, uh, and then actually, the final representation, Z primed, is, uh, has what's called a residual connection, where I just add this to the old representation Q. So in some sense, I'm just learning a delta. And then I throw in a layer norm and a feedforward network for, well, the feedforward network is important for, for nonlinearity, and, and, but yeah. So that's the basic transformation, okay? So very, very efficient, because you can implement everything using matrix operations. Uh, <laughs> I think there are a ton of interesting theory questions here. How to analyze this thing? I really, really do. I don't think we have much clue what it's doing. Okay, uh, but it's it's incredibly effective on these tasks. So how do we apply transformers to question answering, or for example, to natural questions? Well, one key key innovation by um, this group of authors from 2018 was to actually train the parameters of these networks using um, very large quantities of unlabeled data. So you can take all of Wikipedia, and you can set up a proxy task. For example, if I give you a sentence but remove 10% of the words at random, um, train a model that tries to predict which words are missing. And you can use the transformer to get a representation, which is then used to make this prediction. Um, that's the basic idea behind BERT. Um, oh, the one thing I should have said is, is this transformation, by the way, that's a single layer. This is iterated multiple times. You might easily have 10 or 12 iterations of these kind of transformations, uh, producing progressively deeper and deeper and, and more abstract representations. OK. Um, so that's a way of pre-training these things. And it's been shown recently that this leads to uh, Extreme improvements on many tasks. The best parsing result they showed you uses BERT, for example. And um, in question answering, uh, this is an architecture which the BERT people came up with or, and, and was refined by Chris Alberti and Kenton Lee. So um, we simply take the input sequence to be a concatenation of the question and a candidate paragraph. The paragraph may or may not contain an answer. We apply transformers with BERT pre-training. And we use the embeddings that, that we have per word to predict for each word whether it's the start or end of an answer. Or we, we use these embeddings to predict that uh, no answer exists. That's it. So you basically just lift transformers, pre-train them, and you can just uh, use the question answering data in that context. So here are some results. Um, so on the left is results for accuracy in recovering the correct paragraph on the page or uh, saying that there's no answer on the page. So you basically uh, have a task where you're trying to predict whether or not there's an answer on the page, and if there is an answer, where it is. Um, a couple of old methods um, are at the top, and BERT scores about 65 on this. Okay. Um, so that's an impressive improvement over previous results, but it's still a long way off human performance. So. The super annotated performance, 87, is what we think is a true upper limit on performance on this task. And that's actually um, formed by taking an ensemble of humans, taking 20 humans, getting a vote from them, and evaluating that against our evaluation measures. If you take a single human, you get around 73%. Um, I have a strong belief that the super annotator is what we really should be shooting for. Okay, so uh, it's interesting when you look at single human performance as an upper limit, whether that should really be the upper limit. On short answer recovery, the super annotator is about 75%, and the BERT based model is 52. Let me finish up with some examples because I think these will sort of raise 
some interesting questions. So for me, the really interesting question moving forward is what kind of knowledge is a transformer-based model encoding? And can that start to get towards the kind of inferences, uh, kind of performance that humans have on these kind of tasks? And so here are a few examples from the natural questions um, which illustrate various phenomena, which I think are, are very interesting to think about from a linguistic point of view. And then if we could possibly get towards theory of how neural networks might be able, able to represent this knowledge and reason about it, I think that would be very interesting. Um, these were not cherry picked. They're very easy to find in the data. Um, so here's the first question. Where did the captain sleep on the Mayflower? Uh, the human annotated this. Aft on the main deck in the stern was the cabin for Master Christopher Jones. So a couple of, this is from the, the, the Wikipedia page on the Mayflower. A couple of interesting things here. Um, if you see the sentence, you know it's from the page in the, uh, on the Mayflower, you would have a strong suspicion that Master Christopher Jones was the captain, but you'd also know how to check the rest of the page to make sure that's true, okay? Verify that. And secondly, you almost have, a, I, I think, a, a, a reflexive response that the fact that this is specifying the location for the cabin specifies where the person sleeps, right? So you have this sort of common sense knowledge. Um, and I think it's fascinating to think about how we could potentially learn this kind of common sense knowledge or whether indeed transformers are already learning this common sense knowledge. It's not clear to me they are. Okay, so that's one example. Um, when did the Jets last win the Super Bowl? So, you know, you could just have a database of this kind of information, but if you look at extracting it from language, you get some interesting problems. So, um, we have a sentence here. The Jets advanced to the playoffs for the first time in 1968 and went on to compete in Super Bowl III where they defeated the Baltimore Colts. Um, so that's evidence that they won it in 68, or actually if you think about it, early 69, if you know the Super Bowl is usually held early the year after the playoffs, right? Um, it's sort of ambiguous. But it's asking when did they last win it? Well, the, the, uh, the, the paragraph goes on and it finishes with, however, the Jets have never returned to the Super Bowl. Okay, so there's, there's some pretty complex multi-sentence inference here. Um, Here's another one. How many times has Jerry Brown been governor of California? Um, the sentence says he's an American politician, serving as the 39th and current governor of California since 2011, previously holding the position from 75 to 83. This requires uh, various elements of temporal reasoning, the fact that he's been governor for two periods, uh, potentially the fact that each, each uh, term is four years, and so on, uh, what the current date is, and so on. So this requires, in a sense, like the arithmetic problems that Shai was talking about, this requires temporal reasoning, which is quite interesting. Um, here's another one. Who was the first person to see Earth from space? Um, this is actually a borderline annotation. So uh, it's probably correct, but I don't think the evidence is all here. Uh, so you have Yuri Gagarin, was a Soviet pilot and a cosmonaut. He became the first human to journey into outer space, when is Vostok, and so on. Um, is space the same as outer space? Uh, did, his, did his spacecraft have a window? Could he see out the window? We know as humans that we need to verify all these facts. And I think, you know, if we really want to have machines that understand and explain their inferences, we need machines that can give answers with caveats or go elsewhere and verify and try to correct knowledge. This seems like science fiction, but if we're going to try to solve AI, this is what we need to start getting towards. Um, and I think it, it does resonate with Shai's point about sort of um, neural networks and more logical, more com uh, hard inferences being produced and, and the interaction of those two things. Okay, um, so I think I'm almost done. Just to, just to conclude, I spoke about these uh, three problems, three architectures. Um, I guess the other thing I would emphasize is I, I really think data is, is hugely important. So uh, once we have good data sets for problems, we often start making progress. ImageNet was huge in vision. The speech data sets have been huge. The Pentry Bank has been of enormous benefit. There are problems, for example, dialogue systems, systems that talk to people where it's, it's, it's hard to imagine exactly how you collect data. And I think that could be as, a bigger problem from an engineering standpoint as any other. Um, but hopefully you've got an impression of this, this sequence of architectures which build in complexity. The empirical results have been astounding and 
I think the optimistic thing is there are some really juicy theory problems here, which will, if we get to understand these networks better, will only advance the science of this whole field. Great, I'll finish there, thanks.